Hi, we are Pauline and Randy Phillips. We are so thankful for the Sabbath day and for the opportunity to welcome our CCC family and all our streaming guests to our worship service today. We invite you to open your hearts to the blessing God has in store for us through his word and through his presence today of all the week the best. I invite you to pray with me. O oh, Heavenly Father, creator of the universe and of this special day, the seventh day Sabbath, we come in your presence now. Some of us may be in places where it's sunny. We pray that the sunshine of your love will be our experience. Others may be in places where it's raining and we pray that showers of blessing shall cover us. Father, we may even be in places where it is snowing. And we pray that like Isaiah 1:18, we can recognize that though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. So come in this space, in this hour, and may your power be felt as we worship you. We pray these blessings through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family, and happy Sabbath. It's my privilege and joy to share today's announcements with you. If you would like to receive the announcements or be placed on our mailing list, then simply go to columbiacentersda.org slash bulletin. Today, we don't have a lot of announcements, but we would like our members to please save the date of October the 8th. On October the 8th, after Sabbath, we will have another town hall meeting where we will be able to provide an update on the renovation project here at our new church home. This week, you should have received by email a schedule of the remaining projects that still need to be done, as well as a suggested timeline. I know that this has been a long and winding road that we have been on with COVID and the supply chain and the delays. Uh, we are just grateful that we have gotten thus far. We are almost at the end. I know you are tired. I know you are weary and longing for us to be able to come together. No one knows that better than me, but I'm praying that you will still hold on uh, we are almost at the finish line. It reminds me of that church hymn of the refrain, we are nearing home. We are nearing home. Uh, I am looking forward to the time when we will be able to worship here, for starting out in the fellowship hall and then eventually uh, in our new sanctuary. So please hold on, please let's continue to pray. Let's continue to be supportive of our family here. We want to keep all of our members lifted up in prayer, those who have experienced losses, uh, our caregivers. We know God has something special in store for us. Again, if you would like to receive uh, the announcements or to be placed on the mailing list, simply go to columbiacentersda.org slash bulletin. May God bless you real good today. Hello again, everyone. I don't know about you, but I have had a long week. And so today we had a beautiful opportunity to rest and not just to rest, but to take our most deepest concerns and petitions to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So whatever you may be feeling, whether you have exclaimed it outwardly or you have kept it to yourself, now is the opportunity for us to take it to the throne of grace. So everyone bow your heads as we talk to our Father in heaven. Father, Lord, we are grateful today that you have given us another opportunity to, to praise your name, Lord. Uh, we have 
come this far in a year like no other, God. It seems like every month something happens that just seems to, to outdo the last month there, God. Every month something takes place that just rattles our souls, Lord, that just shakes us up there, Lord, that just pushes us down, Lord. We've had people die around us, Lord. People have lost loved ones there, God. People have lost jobs there, Lord. People's health is declining, um, Lord. People's marriages are on the rocks there, God. People are wondering where, where the next paycheck is going to come from there, Lord. People are concerned about their children, Lord God, in class, virtual learning. What are we all going to do? Father, we know that you said that this was to come. It said uh, in your word, dear Lord, that all of these things need to pass, God, in order for your, your second coming, God. And so we're going to trust you, Lord, in this time. We're going to hold on to you uh, as we continue to move through the year. Father, somebody is out there right now that is just at wit's end, Lord. They have been crying, crying rivers, Lord God, because they just can't seem to find the help they need. And whoever this individual is or whoever these individuals are, Lord, we are coming together, God, in the name of Jesus, asking for deliverance for them, Lord God. Lord, somebody has been dealing with a medical issue for a long period of time, Lord. They do not know, the doctors do not know exactly how to treat it, Lord God. Uh, the, their, their friends don't necessarily know um, what to prescribe them, Lord God. They themselves don't know what it is, and they have been quietly praying to you, Lord Jesus. God, we're asking in this moment that you be with them in a special way, Lord, that us as a community can come together, Lord God, and lift them up to your throne. God, you say that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours, Lord, and that includes health, Lord God. That includes you being the great physician, Lord God. And so we want to ask in the name of Jesus that you work a miracle in these individuals' lives, Lord Jesus. We're asking that you restore their health, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Restore their, their mental health, Lord God. Restore their, their physical health. And if they have been down and out um, on, the, on their word, on reading their word, Lord God, restore them spiritually as well. Lord, it just seems like we are at a point in Earth's history where the Earth has been crying out. It seems as if humanity has pushed back against nature for so long and nature is, is finally, finally responding in anguish and, and, and in pain, Lord God. It seems like everything that we have done over all these years, Lord God, that you have been trying to get our attention. Well, Lord, you have our attention now. God, we are asking again in the name of Jesus that you, 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 you help us to keep the faith. Lord, help us to trust you even when we cannot trace you. Lord, help us to, 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 to remember what God we serve and who we serve, Lord. Help us to remember all the times that you brought us through. Lord, someone is struggling right now, God. They are at their wits and Father, I am praying in the name of Jesus for restoration over them, God. We want to speak life over their finances. We want to speak life over their relationship, God. We want to speak life over their, uh, their marriages, God. We want to speak life over their children, Lord Jesus. God, bring a calming spirit into folks' homes right now. Lord, bring a calming spirit into the minds of those who are having trouble sleeping, Lord God. Bring a calming spirit, Lord Jesus, into those who are, are, are on LinkedIn and, and Indeed and, and all these other job sites, God, looking for another place to earn income. God, we are uh, not just asking for favors, Lord God, but we are we are asking, Lord, just for for um, a continued. Uh, we're asking God for just for you to just help us continue to move forward, God, just step by step, Lord Jesus. God, we are praying today that as we receive a word uh, from your manservant, Lord God, Pastor Gary Wimbish, we are praying in a special way that you speak to him and that you speak through him and that you speak over him, Lord God, as he presents a word from on high. God, may we tune our ears to receive the message that you have sent uh, the man of God today. And may we be willing to not just be hearers of that word, Lord, but be doers of that word. Revive us again, Lord Jesus. Give us a revival in the middle of this pandemic because Lord knows that we all need it. You know, God, that we all need it. Revive us again, Lord God. And for all the things 
that I have not asked God within this petition, Lord, please do not withhold from your people. God, be with each and every individual under the sound of my voice. Give them the, the courage and the confidence, God, to move forward in faith and in purpose. For those that are feeling very alone, Lord God, for those who may not have a family member to talk to, or a spouse, or a significant other, or or a, or a, or a friend, for those who are feeling really alone in this moment, God, I am asking that you send your angels, Lord Jesus, to minister to them, Lord. Be present and evident in their lives. Lord, never, ever leave us alone. And also, help us to remember that we truly are never alone. Father God, we are putting all of these requests at the foot of the cross, knowing that Jesus died there 2,000 years ago to save us from sins that we had no idea we were going to commit and sins that we have yet to commit, Lord. We are thankful for the cross. God, help us to look towards the cross and remember the cross whenever we are going through situations like this. And I pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, uh, that you bless your people. Bless those who are continuing to, to, to spread the message, to spread the gospel, Lord, not even even just locally or nationally, God, but internationally, Lord. Your message has to reach the entire world. Everyone needs an opportunity to know who the Son of God is, Lord, before you return. So give us the, the faith and the strength to finish the mission. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. This song reminds us that whatever we may have just brought to the altar, what we may have just prayed about, we can have joy and even exceeding joy in the knowledge that Jesus will answer when we call, that he will lift the lowly, that he stands ready to do great things for us. So let's praise him this afternoon in this song and celebrate God and how mighty and holy he is. This may be a new song to you, but it has ministered to me so greatly all week, and I pray that it will resonate with you and that you'll sing along with us. Bye. 
only he is holy. Only you are holy. Only you are holy. Only you are worthy. Only you are worthy. Only you are wonderful. For there's no one else like you who is faithful and very true. Oh, my love, my heart, my life is a Good morning and happy Sabbath, CCC and friends. I trust that you have had a delightful week and that you have come prepared as we study God's word today. As always, we are grateful to our musicians and our guest artists who provide the musical selections that enhances our worship service. Today's message is entitled, The Triage of Spiritual Growth. And the foundation passage is coming from the book of Romans, chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4. But before we begin, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer to our Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning so grateful that you have watched over us and spared our lives to be able to come once again on this beautiful Sabbath morning to praise your holy name. And now I simply ask that you would enter into our hearts and our minds as we open your word, as we seek to trace your divine footprints so that we can come face to face with the author of eternal life, 
our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, is my prayer in your holy name. Amen. This week, in fact, the past week and a half, we looked at and celebrated and commemorated 10 days of mourning of Queen Elizabeth II. We also saw an escalation in Russia's war against the Ukraine and the threat of a nuclear war from President Putin. And then uh, we saw the continued political saga that is taking place in our country, uh, the vast political divide between those who want to adhere to the principles of democracy versus those who are election deniers. And then to make matters worse, we saw the CDC issue a public warning advising young people and others not to cook chicken with NyQuil. Now, while this might seem absurd to you and to me, there are individuals who took the challenge on TikTok and some became severely ill and some even lost their lives. All of these are indicators that we are living in the closing hours of Earth's history. And now more than ever, it is critical that we come close to our Lord and our Savior through his word, under the unction and the guidance and the direction of God's Holy Spirit, so that we can have our hearts in total synchronicity with the heart of our Savior. Which leads me to our discussion for today. And I truly want to have a Bible study uh, as a group. So I'm hoping that you will have your Bibles or your electronic devices, whichever you use, uh, as we open his word. The term triage. Uh, this is a medical term that is utilized in emergency rooms or in situations where there might not be sufficient medical resources due to the uh, travesty of the situation that they are dealing with. And so they will basically assess each individual patient to determine whether or not they need to be in the most urgent category or the urgent or the less urgent. Out of all of the various venues, these are the three broad common denominators that you find with uh, the nurses and medical staff that's dealing with uh, a situation, as I've just mentioned. Sometimes there are insufficient doctors and nurses. In fact, we have a relative who is living in a certain section of the country, and there are hospitals uh, operating under severe shortages, not enough doctors, not enough nurses. So family members and other advocate, advocates are having to come to assist their loved ones who find themselves in these predicaments. But they'll go through this process of triage, making a determination and establishing a priority of individuals who will receive the limited medical resources that are available. Well, as we open God's word today, I am grateful, number one, that there is no shortage of salvific remedies. Uh, our Lord and our Savior is sufficient. He has thousands upon thousands times 10,000 of heavenly angels and messengers who are angels of mercy, messengers of hope, and of then, of course, the Holy Spirit, who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, who can be at the, everywhere at the same time. So we are blessed to know that in spite of our circumstances and our situations, we have a divine physician, a healer of the soul, that will not prioritize us, but makes his availability and his power uniquely available to us regardless of our circumstances. But as we are looking at this triage in spiritual growth, the first station that we come to, and I have to admit, it's a bit of bad news. In Romans chapter three and verses nine through 12 and verse 18, it basically tells us everybody has come under the power of sin. In fact, let's read what Paul says. All are under the power of sin. Verse 10, as the scriptures say, 
No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. In verse 18, they have no fear of God at all. You'll recall in the first uh, two chapters of Romans, Paul is establishing the premise that even though Jews who had the law of God, who had this rich salvific history of the covenant, that they themselves were still in the same predicament as Gentiles, who had no law, who did not have the promises of God. They were all under the power and the penalty of sin. In fact, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Paul says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So there it is. Regardless of your pedigree, regardless of your religious orientation, your education and your status is immaterial. Your financial wealth is really not, the, not a factor. Every man, woman, and child has come under the power of sin because of the level of deception and for Adam and Eve bequeathing their ability to choose God over Lucifer. They gave that up, and now we're dealing with the after effects of this. That's the bad news. In spite of all the progress that humanity has made, in spite of the scientific inventions that have taken place that have increased and elevated our quality of life, in spite of all of the good deeds and the, and the Nobel Peace Prize offerings and, and the recipients and the tasks that they have provided and the things that they have done that has helped mankind, we all have come under the power and the penalty of sin. But here is the good news, talking about the triage of spiritual growth. Here's the good news. Romans chapter 5 and verse 18. It lets me know that sin no longer has control over us. That the power and the penalty of sin no longer has to rule over me. You and I have the ability of being emancipated. Here is the great emancipation proclamation. Listen to what Paul says, Romans 5, 18. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. So I want you to see this progression. I want you to see this dynamic and this contrast. On number one, the bad news, everybody has come under the power and the penalty of sin. Here's the good news. The good news is that even though Adam's one sin brought condemnation for everyone, Christ's one act of righteousness when he lived his life and then he died on the cross, that one act brought us to a point where we could be reconciled with the Father, where there can now be a right relationship. We are now back on course, on an even keel. And notice that coordinating conjunction. So God has, Jesus in his death has restored us in a right relationship with God, where I can now call him Abba, Abba Father where he no longer sees me and I see him as a consuming fire because of his holiness and my sinfulness. But because of Christ's one act of dying on the cross for my sins, now I am able to enter into a right relationship and receive this new life. Now, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So therefore, not only am I forgiven, of all of my sins that I have ever committed, as well as the ones that I will 
possibly commit in the future. Not only am I forgiven of those sins, I am now empowered because I now have this new life that comes from Jesus Christ. Well, how does that happen? Romans chapter six and verse five. Listen to what Paul says. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. So I am crucified with him. Now, of course, Paul is talking about in this tremendous imagery as you read chapters three and chapter five, and now we're looking at chapter six, Paul is talking about that when you are baptized, when you are baptized, you're going into that watery grave. You are symbolically uniting yourself with Jesus's death. Paul talks about being crucified with Christ in Galatians chapter two and 20. When I give him my heart, when I surrender my will to him and I confess all of my sins with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is risen by the power of the Father, I am then saved. And so therefore, this is this new life that he gives me. This is this new life that he brings to me that I am able to experience here and now. So in this baptism, I go down into the watery, the watery grave, I come up and the power of sin and the power really is talking about the penalty, the penalty of sin. I am no longer subjected to the penalty, the soul that sinneth, it shall die for the wages of sin is death. But because Jesus has died for my sins and I am forgiven. When I came up out of that watery grave, that is my former life. I am crucified with him. The old desires, the power of sin is now gone. Now, even though that power that gives me the ability to be forgiven, it does not negate the fact that the presence of sin is still all around me. In fact, there still might be those hidden tendencies and inclinations and hereditary traits that are still in me, in my body. Those are the things that have to be worked out through the process of sanctification, through the process of living with Jesus in an intimate relationship day by day where I am trusting him. So there is a faith dimension, but there is also a work dimension, faith and works. Faith without works is dead. But it is not just my works where I am exerting all of my effort of trying not to sin. It is Jesus Christ. It is God who is working in me because now the spirit of the living God lives in me. So here again, it is this new life that the Lord brings that he gives to us. This is the good news that sin has lost its control over me. It has lost the penalty of sin is death. That no longer becomes my future. Verse 21 of Romans five. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us a right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what we read earlier. And I am crucified with him. And so therefore, sin has lost its power in my life. Well, wait a minute, pastor. You're saying sin has lost its power in my life. Then why do I continue to sin? Why do I continue to trip up? Why do I continue to falter? The power of sin is the penalty or the death of sin, which creates an eternal separation from the Father. The wages of sin is death. I am separated from him. But when you and I understand that in this process of sanctification, in this daily process, and I'm gonna get into it a little bit deeper in just a moment, 
when the spirit is living in me and I am now operating under the premise that the Lord is my savior and the Holy Spirit is residing in me, he is working these things out of me. Those sinful habits and those idiosyncrasies are being worked out. They are being erased. They are being replaced by the power of God who is living and residing in me through his Holy Spirit. You see, there is a distinction between the power of sin and the manifestations of individual sin. What am I talking about? The power of sin deals with, for example, if I have an issue with lying, those lies are merely the manifestation or the fruit of the power of deception that resides in me. It is the internal deception, the desire and the want and the ability uh, or the inclination to deceive, which causes me to lie. So while I might say, Lord, please forgive me of this lie that I told, blah, 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 blah. What I need to be praying and asking and depending on God to do is deal with the root of deception, the root of sin that lies within us. Because that is the thing that is going to separate us from God. Let me give you another example. Remember Lucifer in heaven? In, the, in God's throne room where there was all peace and happiness and joy and truth and the father is there and the son is there in that economy of holiness the power of sin which is why it's called the mystery of iniquity the power of sin began to creep up in Lucifer's mind and heart and the servant of the Lord tells us in Patriarchs and Prophets in chapter one of uh, why, why sin was permitted in, the, in, in, in heaven, even before the world, before the earth was created. Lucifer did not deal with the power of sin. And that power of sin, that strange confluence of emotions and pride evolved in his mind and in his heart and out of that power of sin came his first deadly sin of pride and then lies and then deception so for us when we are crucified with jesus christ and we give him our hearts and our minds the power of sin and the penalty of sin ceases for us because we are now covered. That's what Paul means in Romans 8 and verse 1. So now there is now no condemnation to those who belong to Jesus. But the thing is, I need to be crucified with him. The old self, the man of flesh, those emotions that power that is alien to the message of love of Jesus Christ that is in my flesh. Well, I'm going to read just a few passages in a moment that that is going to hopefully, I started to say, will blow your mind, but I hope that it will enlighten your mind so that you can see how vivid and how potent this triage of spiritual growth that the Lord has for us. The bad news, where we have all sin. The good news, sin no longer has to have control over you. What else does Paul tell us? Romans 6 and verses 9 and 10. He says, we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death, get this, no longer has any power over him. Verse 10, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. See, there is that connection. When Jesus died on the cross, that sacrifice was a one-time finale where Satan knew his fate was sealed, where he knew 
when Jesus died on the cross on Calvary and rose from the grave, Satan knew that his end that was predicted and foretold in revelation that he would be cast into the lake of the fire where Satan and death, the last enemy, will be destroyed. That same victory is available to you and to me right now, every single day. This is why Paul says, the power of sin and the penalty of sin no longer can control you. No longer can control you. Well, friends of mine, let me tell you something. When you and I, through the tutelage of God's Holy Spirit, embraces this truth, not just intellectually, but experientially in our hearts, we then are able to begin every day and we have this new God-given zeal and strength in confronting the areas of brokenness in our lives. In other words, I'm no longer subjected to this yo-yo up and down emotion every time I commit a sin and I think that I'm on the precipice of going to hell. That is what Satan wants us to do because he distorts and disfigures the message and the meaning and the purpose and the love of God. He knows that we are weak. He knows that we are flesh and blood, which is why he needs us to come close to him, to partner with him so that we can be victorious and how we are victorious. It is not by us trying to keep the law. Paul tells us that very clearly. But it is through the reign of God's grace because he has given us the gift of his righteousness. He has given us the gift of forgiveness. And he brings us to a point where we can be reconciled back to him. But now here is the predicament. Here is the challenge. You see, we know that all have sinned. Here's the good news. Sin no longer has to have control over us of, because of all the aforementioned passages and points that I've shared with you. And Paul knew this, but here was Paul's predicament and it is your predicament as well as mine. Believers, even though we know all of this, we continue to struggle with sin on a day by day basis. Paul understood this and Paul writes about this. Romans chapter 7 verses 14 through 18. Paul says, so the trouble is not with the law for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me for I am all too human, a slave to sin. Now this is the preacher. This is the apostle Paul. Verse 15, I don't really understand myself for what I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Verse 16, but if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. Verse 19, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Can you identify with this? Paul is saying, I know what's right and what is wrong. I'm not an idiot. I'm not a moron. I'm not spiritually obtuse. But the things that I know I ought to do, those are the very things I don't do. And the things that I shouldn't do, those are the things that I absolutely gravitate to. Verse 21, Paul says, I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Now, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me. Now, you ought to underscore that right there. There is another power in me. Paul is talking about 
the personal civil war that we are dealing with. We know what is right, but we naturally do what is wrong. Another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. What? What do you mean, Paul? Sin that is still within you? I thought you just said that you were crucified with Christ. That you have this new life, but yet here you're saying the sin is still in you? How do you resolve this, Paul? And then he says, verse 24, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And verse 25, he gives us the coup d'etat. He says, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. But he doesn't stop there. He gives us this challenge, as I've just stated. I know, the, I know what I ought to do, but those are the, that's the very thing I don't do. I know what I shouldn't do, and that's the very thing that I do. I am miserable. I'm on this spiritual roller coaster and then I end up feeling guilty and then it makes me doubt my own sincerity and my own conversion experience. It makes me think that my baptism was powerless and meaningless. I went down a dry center and came up a wet center. I am miserable. So where is the answer? He says the answer is in Jesus Christ. But what does that mean, Paul? I'm almost done. Romans 8 verses 1 through 4. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Let me stop right there. The linchpin and being able to live a victorious life. And the victorious life is not, does not necessarily mean that you are free from sin. The victorious life means that you now, and Paul uses this prepositional phrase in other translations, in Christ Jesus or in Jesus. I love the translation of the NLT where it says you belong to him. And because you belong to him, and we're going to find out in just a moment, what does that mean belonging to him? It is when, I'm going to go ahead and tell you in verse 9, it is when God's Holy Spirit is living in you. When you are controlled by the spirit and not controlled by your own ego, your own selfish desires and aspirations. When Jesus comes first, and this is what is available to those who belong to Jesus and the spirit is in you. Listen to how he elucidates what this means. Verse two, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The power of the life-giving spirit is what raised Jesus out of that darkened tomb. It is the power of God's spirit that brings to an end the power and the penalty of sin in your life. So I am no longer under the threat of eternal separation from God. I have God's Holy Spirit that is going to be transforming me, giving me the victory over every sin, over every hindrance, but it is going to be a daily process there is a continuum, a spiritual continuum, a progression as I am walking with Jesus, as I am communing with him. This is where the spiritual disciplines kick into operation as I go hand in hand with the master. Now notice in verse three, Paul says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law 
could not do. You know, I, I had to really, I have to really stop there because I want you to, to, to get this. There is no keeping of the Ten Commandments that will earn you salvation. The law never was given nor was devised to be a saving element. It is not the law's purpose to save you or to change you. The only one who can save you is Jesus. And it is because of God's gift of grace. Paul tells us it is a free gift that cannot be earned. That's why no one can boast that I have done X, Y, Z. And so therefore God has to save me. No, the law was unable to do this. Let's go on in verse three. So God did what the law could not do. The law couldn't do this. So God sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. My friends, I want you to know that God, when Paul says that God is our savior, when Jesus says no one can come to the Father unless they come through me and no one comes unless God has drawn them, God is the divine initiator. He is the sustainer. He is the provider of our salvation. And he is saying that in this triage, as you're moving from station to station in your spiritual growth, you will first understand and come to the conviction that all have sinned. And then you discover sin does no longer have control over you because what he has done. But then you also understand, I'm still struggling with this. What I want to do, that's what I don't do. What I shouldn't do, that's exactly what I do. What a miserable person I am. Who's going to deliver me? Jesus Thank God for Jesus. And how does he do that? For those who belong to Jesus, for those who are in the spirit, for those who have invited Jesus Christ to come and live in their hearts and to guide their everyday life existence. It is this Jesus who says, sin no longer has control over us because he has given his son for our sins. So therefore, I live by the Spirit of God. So there will be, there will be dark days perchance, there will be blessed days. But the commitment you and I have to make is that every single day and in every situation and every circumstance, it is the Spirit of God that is warming us, that is guiding us, that is teaching us, that gives you, that gives me the ability to continue to hold on to His hand where it is his word that is abiding and dwelling in my heart. He is the one who has promised he will never leave you nor forsake you. And there is no circumstance, there is no situation that is too hard for the Lord. In fact, the question is asked, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Absolutely not. The question is, Will you accept, will you accept the invitation that Jesus has extended to you today? Will you now are willing to live by the power of God's Holy Spirit, where the power and the penalty of sin no longer controls you, 
because Jesus Christ is now your Lord and your Savior. If that is your prayer today, then I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me. And possibly you have a special prayer request. I'm going to ask that you would just offer that request to Jesus right now as I am praying for you. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have given us not only the plan of salvation, but a personal invitation to come to the foot of your cross to receive the forgiveness that you have for us and to be a beneficiary of your wonderful, marvelous gift of grace and righteousness and the promise of the power of the life-giving spirit that will be available to us every single day. It is my prayer that whatever the struggle is, whatever the temptations, whatever the challenges, whatever the situations, whether it's the depths of depression, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's relational issues, whether it's financial problems, whether it's mental health challenges, Lord, I'm praying today that you will come close to everyone that is, that is viewing this teaching today and you will extend to them the guarantee that if they call, you will answer. Because you have said, even before you call, I will answer. This is my prayer request. And I know that you will hear and you will answer because you are the one who declared if evil parents are willing to give good gifts to their children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit if we ask? So I'm asking today, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and your dear Son, I am asking, Lord, grant unto us your life-giving Spirit that will meet every situation that we are faced with. This is my prayer, and I thank you for hearing it. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you richly today. Our mission at CCCSDA is to share God's love with everyone, everywhere, every day. The ministries through which we carry out this mission are supported by the prayers and gifts of those whom God impresses to give. We encourage our members to continue your support through our online giving link. To our friends and guests, we invite you to use the PayPal or Cash App link on your screen to support the mission of CCCSDA as you have been blessed and led by the Lord. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for fellowshipping with us here at Columbia Community Center. May God be victorious in your life this week and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sabbath.